I can't imagine a, a domain of human endeavor that isn't impacted by the imagination. I mean, teasing the imagination apart from the talking monkey is not an easy thing to do. Imagining ourselves without imagination is itself a paradox. Uh, and yet, you know, what is it? And, and why is it? If you take the view that uh, biology does nothing in vain and evolutionary economics are incredibly spare, then why have this faculty that allows one to command and manipulate realities which do not exist? I mean, that's, to my mind, the basic function of the imagination. Some people might argue and say, well, for most people, the imagination is the coordination of mundane data. In other words, if I work this hard and if I have this much money, can I afford that car? To my mind, this is not putting great pressure on the human imagination. Uh, the human imagination, as I uh, suppose it, is uh, almost an extension of the visual faculty. Uh, imagination is something that one beholds, something that takes, people speak of castles in the air or something like that. Uh, one idea that is worth entertaining because it is entertaining, not necessarily because it's the truth, but is the idea <coughs> that the imagination is actually a, a kind of window onto realities not present. In other words, it, it's very clear from an evolutionary point of view that our, our body and our sensory perceptors are organized in such a way as to protect us, to, to warn of danger, to give you the muscles to respond to that danger when it comes. The imagination doesn't seem to work quite like that. If the imagination runs riot in the dimension of the mundane, it's paranoia. In other words, if you believe every cop on the corner is looking at you, every chance heard comment uh, is about you, the imagination is, in that situation, pathological. It is taking the raw data of experience and giving it uh, a maladaptive spin. So then, uh, where is the imagination appropriate? And it seems that it is most appropriate in the domain of human uh, creativity. That, uh, in fact, separating art from imagination is simply the, the exercise of separating uh, cause from effect. Art sculpture, poetry, painting, dance, is, is like the footprint of where the imagination has been. And you know, the abstract expressionists, uh, uh, Pollock particularly, always insisted that a painting, a, a Pollock is not what the process is about. The process is about making a Pollock, being Pollock, the act of creation. What the rest of us are then left with is a, a husk, a tracing, uh, something left behind which says imagination was here, imagination acted in this place, and this is, uh, this is what is left. Uh, a very interesting thing that's going on in physics at the moment is 
and I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's slightly off subject, although it certainly is fascinating. Uh, the great bridge between art and science that was supposedly built in the 20th century hinged on this thing called the uncertainty principle. Uh, it was the idea that as you know more and more things about certain aspects of a system, an atomic system in this case, certain other parts of it lose focus and become less and less clear. For example, if you know velocity, you don't know position. As you hone in on exact position, velocity becomes smeared out. And probably more ink and more breath beating has been shed over this aspect of modern physics than any other. Now, to the great embarrassment of all the people who held workshops and wrote books and pontificated on this matter, it appears that this is what it always looked like, fuzzy and confused thinking. And that uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, or rather the Heisenberg formulation of the quantum theory, uh, is uh, now not to be preferred. The preferred understanding now is the version of quantum theory formulated by David Bohm. The difference between these two theories mathematically is precisely zero. There is no difference. But they make different assumptions. And the reason originally the Heisenberg formulation was preferred was because it was felt that this uncertainty principle, which was a hard swallow, was not as hard to swallow as a piece of baggage which the Bohm theory carried embedded in it. And that piece of baggage was called non-locality. The two theories produced identical mathematical descriptions of nature, but one had this uncertainty principle in it. The other had built into it non-locality. Non-locality is the idea that any two particles that have been associated with each other in the past retain across space and time a kind of uh, connectivity such that if you, are, if you change a physical aspect of one of these particles, the law of the conservation of parity will cause the other particle to also undergo a change at the exact same moment, even though they may by now be separated by millions of light years of space and time. This was thought to be so counterintuitive, so preposterous, that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle was, was chosen as the lesser of two evils. But it turns out over the past 10 years, experiments have been done in the laboratory, not thought experiments, actual apparatus experiments, which secure that non-locality actually is real. It, there is, uh, below the ordinary surface of space and time, ruled by relativistic physics, there is this strange domain of instantaneous connectivity of all matter, of all phenomena. Uh, it raises the possibility then that the imagination is in fact a kind of uh, organ of perception, not an organ of creative uh, uh, unfoldment, but actually an organ of perception, and that what is perceived in the imagination is that which is not local and never can be. So uh, I, I myself am up in the air about this, or as you get to know me better, you will see I don't feel the need to believe or disbelieve to proclaim this true or untrue, uh, but it is useful 
at this stage for understanding uh, our mental life. Uh, I've spent a lot of time talking to people and thinking about the origins of consciousness. And in one sense, asking the question, what is the imagination? is a different way of asking the same question. What is the origin of consciousness? Uh, and as some of you know, to ex distraction, I believe that psilocybin mushrooms played a role kick-starting human evolution. I don't want to repeat all that here. It's been taped <coughs> many times. But uh, what I want to point out is that we can see in nature, I think, the uh, declension from the full-blown human imaginative capacity back into the organization of the animal mind. We can see the stages through which this must have unfolded. The interesting animal to look at in all of this uh, for the moment, are the top carnivores. This is not PC in a vegan environment, but hey, <coughs> thought just has to lead you wherever it leads you. It's very clear to me that top carnivores coordinate data in the environment uh, very judiciously. Cows have very little to say about grass. But cats, hunting cats, have a great deal to say about their diet. Because a top carnivore, to be successful, must, in a certain sense, think like its prey. And so at the very point of the emergence of these coordinated strategies held in the mind, there's a paradox. The earliest consciousness is consciousness which apes other consciousness. In other words, the top carnivore that is most successful is the carnivore that can think most like a weasel or a groundhog or a rabbit because this ability to think like the prey gives you a leg up on the prey. And if you've ever seen uh, not domestic cats, but small jungle hunting cats or jaguars or something like that in the sudden presence of a chicken a hundred feet away or something, they fall into a fit of imagining because they can almost taste it. They probably can taste it. And they fall into uh, a strategic mode that is clearly an intense state of imagining, but it is triggered by uh, the presence of the prey. What is interesting about human beings is we went one step beyond that. We, we for reasons which don't need to concern us here, acquired the ability to strategically suppose not in the presence of the stimulus, but in fact, back in the back of the cave around the fire with our bellies full, telling tall tales. Uh, and it's interesting that the imagination is the land of what if. And what if is a kind, is, is almost like a statement in a computer language. If is a Boolean operator, if you know what I mean. If uh, breaks the flow of reality into two possibilities, if A or B or more. And uh, this ability to contemplate worlds which are only in potentia is the basis of the imagination. And I would submit to you, since we all are sitting here in monkey bodies, that it's pretty clear that the stimulus for all this if thinking uh, comes in two forms. Uh, 
uh, food and sex. In other words, we think about what we are going to eat. We construct our behavior along an if tree. If I go to the water hole, if I take my sharpened arrows, if I lie in wait, if the gods favor me, I will bring down dinner. The sexual game is played the same way. If I approach the desirable female with the correct offerings, if her mood is correct, if my gifts are found pleasing, then some wonderful thing will follow from all of this. So animals, I don't think, think like this. They may think, but they don't think like this. Uh, it seems to be a unique human ability that uh, probably has to do with, as I say, in our case, there were many different factors. For example, we became the top carnivore on the planet, but who would have placed their bet on, on a monkey? to be the top carnivore when there were saber-toothed cats walking around that weighed 1,100 pounds. How were we able to insinuate ourselves into a more powerful position than these enormously powerful animals that we once shared the earth with and that, in fact, we hunted to extinction? It's our uh, destiny and our fate to have removed the so-called megafauna from this planet. It, it uh, is now generally agreed by paleontologists that the disappearance of the megafauna and the appearance of the human beings are, are uh, linked <coughs> in time. Well, we did this by imitating those carnivores, and imitation is an act of the imagination. We like in our story about ourselves to think of ourselves as bold hunters, but the the evolutionary truth of the matter is probably that as the first wave of primate radiation into the grassland occurred, as the diet was in transition, we were scavengers of carrion. We were not noble hunters bringing down mighty animals. We followed along behind lions lion kills. There's one school of evolutionary theory that believes this is why our olfactory senses are so diminished, because, quite frankly, we had our face in rotten meat for a million years. And if that doesn't dull your appetite for keen smells, uh, nothing will. Least you despair, I'll tell you that there's a counter theory which says, no, no, we lost our sense of smell when we stood upright because it lifted our face off the ground. Uh, in either case, there seems to be the idea that when you get away from the olfactory action, the, the uh, uh, energy to support the maintenance of that sense collapses. For whatever reason, uh, we made our way to the brink of the imagination. In other words, I don't think we require a deus ex machina to, to take ourselves to the position of being top carnivore on the planet. We have a mean throwing arm. And, you know, you may notice no animal throws things the way we do. Uh, other primates hurl excrement down on agonized explorers, but fortunately, <laughs> not with great accuracy. And anyway, that particularly ma material is rarely deadly anyway. But a human being, for example, a big league baseball pitcher, can, at 125 miles an hour, put a baseball across a 17-inch plate over and over again. One theory of the origin of consciousness wants to say that throwing something is an interesting action, uh, activity, because though it may appear to be the same activity as digging grubs or scratching your ass or something like that, in fact, 
it requires coordination toward a future outcome that is highly mathematical. In other words, you may not think in numbers, but you must somehow sense the concept of trajectory, coordination of target and intent. And when you get all this up and running, uh, according to some people, you have enough brain power left over to write the Fifth Symphony, invent quantum physics, uh, and paint uh, the Last Supper, if you like. This seems preposterous to me. I think that uh, how the imagination got such a hold on us was that we accepted into our diet catalysts that we were unaware of, that pushed our mental state around, uh, specifically psychedelics of various sorts. And a reasonable working definition of psychedelics, what they do, whether you're for it or against it, whether you think it triggers paranoia or, or uh, ataraxia, uh, they are catalysts for the imagination. They catalyze thought, they, they, thought becomes more baroque, it reaches deeper into reality for data, it sees forms of connectivity that previously escaped it, it makes assumption, leaps of assumption, not always correct, but sometimes correct. So what it does is by, uh, to some degree, transferring chaos, into the mental world, it creates a much richer dynamic. And, um, and so thought processes become more complicated. And in a sense, then, uh, language becomes the behavior which expresses the imagination. Uh, it, it can be expressed in a limited form through dance, through gesture, and of course it can be expressed very well through painting if you've reached the stage where you have painting and are not chipping rock or, or drawing in blood in the sand or something like that. But if you have really a, a rich uh, technology behind your artistic intent, uh, but that rich technology would never have arisen without the intercession of language. And so these two things, which make us unique among nature's productions on this planet, imagination and language seem to be almost like the exterior and interior manifestation of the same thing the same phenomenon. And what it is, is it's a facility with data, an ability to connect it in novel ways uh, for one's own entertainment and amusement, if nothing else. Storytelling is obviously this kind of activity where modules, a ghost, a princess, a lost kingdom, uh, a, a disturbed father-son relationship, these modules are manipulated to entertain people. And you know, it's a cliche that there are only five stories. And I think Robert Graves in The White Goddess argued there's only one story. And we keep telling variants of this story over and over again. Well, uh, the, what history then is, or what culture is, is um, the, the phenomenon that attends the rise and spread of the imagination in the human species. But because the imagination works on this what-if model, it always tends toward idealism. In other words, it, it, it is not simply a, a networked process. It's a networked process with a vector field. In other words, it's going somewhere. It, it's not just a random walk. 
it's headed somewhere. We idealize. If you're going to play the game, what if, uh, most people who are psychologically healthy don't sit around entertaining <coughs> dire possibilities. What if I get a terrible disease? What if I'm run over by a truck? No, people say, what if I make a lot of money? What if I meet somebody who gives me a lot of money? And it, you know, <laughs> it begins to tend toward idealism. And we are obviously uh, ruled by ideals and ideas. Uh, we haven't found a good one yet, but we certainly have sacrificed a lot of blood and time in the process of discovering a whole bunch of bad ideas. And we haven't lost our faith in ideas, even though human history is the record. Not one idea has survived from the distant past. Uh, in its original form. Uh, and some of the most persistent ideas, I would argue, are some of the most pernicious ideas. I mean, the idea of man's inherent uh, uh, flaw, that's an old, old idea, and how much suffering has existed because of it. Uh, but culture, then, is the record of the human imagination. Well, that's fine. That is of interest to anthropologists and somebody else who knows. What gives the whole thing a lot of bite is that more and more the imagination is where we spend our time. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about virtual reality, a an immersive state-of-the-art technology in which you put on goggles and special clothing or enter special environments, and then you are in artificial worlds created by computers. And this is thought to be very woo-woo and far out. But in fact, if you're paying attention, we've been living inside virtual realities for about 10,000 years. I mean, what is a city? but a complete denial of nature and say, no, no, not trees, mud holes, waterfalls, and all that. Straight lines, laid out roads, uh, class hierarchies reflected in local geography, meaning the rich people live here, surrounded by the not-so-rich people, all served by the poor people who are so glad they're not the outcast people. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, urbanization is essentially the first of these impulses where society leaves nature and enters into its own private Idaho. Uh, and uh, the, the growth of cities and the growth of the uh, immediacy, I guess you would say, of the urban experience has been a constant of human evolution since urbanization began. Uh, now, the only difference that the new technologies offer is we are going to do this with light, not mortar, brick, steel, aluminum, and titanium, which are incredibly intractable materials. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me. We started with the toughest stuff. And, uh, uh, and, of course, it cost enormous amounts of human blood and treasure to work with such intractable materials. It's always been amazing to me that the largest buildings human beings ever built are, in a sense, the first buildings human beings ever built, because the pyramids of Egypt are enormous, even by modern scale. And yet they were among the earliest buildings uh, ever built. In virtual reality, the difference between a 100-story building and a 10-story building is one zero. That's all. In a line of code, you specify 100 over 10, and you get a 100-story building instead of a 10-story building. Uh, what this should tell us is that in the domain of light, 
the intractability of matter is overcome. And so we are on the brink of a time. We are, we have arrived. We are at the time where the human imagination now need meet no barriers to its intent. And so we are going to find out who we are. We are going to discover what it means to be human when there is no resistance to human will. Now, uh, I, this is, I suppose, like a litmus test for paranoia. It, is this going to be a nightmare of, you know, uh, 24 hour a day sadomasochistic pornography? Or is it going to be, uh, will we ver- literally build heaven on earth? Knowing what I know about the human animal, I suspect it'll be both and. Uh, because we're not going to get everybody marching in the same direction on this. And one person's hell is another person's heaven. 